Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Make sure you go through every single math problem from this book. If there is any problem at all that gives you trouble, you will find a solution to that problem. Almost all the problems that, that uh, we have already done, if there is any problem that gives you trouble, you will find a solution to the problems from day number 251 through 400. From 251 through 400. The problems that this book contains, the second edition, are almost all same all the same problems on, on exactly the same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. If you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Original, prob original solutions tend to be a little lengthier, they little, tend to be a little bit in-depth. Right now, as a matter of fact, we are solving problems from this book. The GRE Journal Test, the 10th edition. We have been solving quantitative comparison questions from this book because the other two books that I showed you simply do not contain enough quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions are very important. So to get some extra practice, we have been doing problems from here. We are on page number 136 right now. Let's begin then. Problem number 13. Problem number 13, as a matter of fact, is something that we did yesterday already, but there is another, another take, another, another vantage point, another way of looking at it, which I forgot to mention yesterday, so I figured I'll, I will redo it. Here's what's going on. We are told that we have machine A, which we are told makes X units in half an hour. We have another machine, machine B, which we are told takes three quarters of an hour to make X units. Same amount of work, X units for both of them. A makes X unit, B makes X unit, they do the same amount of work. One takes half an hour, the other one takes three quarters of an hour. The question is, how much work does A does? How much work will A do in three hours? And how much work will B do in four hours? And how do they compare? But the simplest, the simplest way is to simply look at it in a logical, rational manner without doing any math, mathematical work at all, which is to realize that this guy takes three quarters of an hour to do the same amount of work as this guy does in half an hour. In other words, B, B's speed, B's speed is 50% slower. B's speed is 50% slower than A. B's speed is 50% slower because he takes half an hour and then another quarter of an hour. He takes another quarter of an hour, which is another 50% of the time. He takes 50% more time. B takes 50% more time to do the same amount of work that A does. Well, if B takes 50% more time to do the same amount of work, then in order for them to, in order for them to have this, do the same amount of work, he would need 50% more time. We just said that. So whatever the amount of work that A will do in three hours, whatever the amount of work that A will do in three hours, B will require four and a half hours. He will require 50% more time. He will require 50% more time. Since, since he doesn't have four and a half hours, since he only has four hours, then the amount of work that he will do in four hours has to be less than the amount of work that A does in three hours. That's all. The answer is A. A will do more work in three hours because B will do the same amount of work in four and a half hours. He doesn't have four and a half hours, he only has four hours. Exactly how much work he will do in four hours, we really don't care. Exactly how, many, how much work A will do, we really don't care. These questions are called quantitative comparison. They are not called quantitative computation. We're not going to sit here and compute anything. Do you understand? Let's do the next one. Number 14. Number 14. Number 14 is a geometry problem, I believe. Yep, it is a geometry problem. Here is how it goes. We are given a circle. This is the center we are told. The, the circle with center O, circle with center O and radius 5. The center of the circle is O. This is this this is center. And we have a line that goes through it. If the line goes through the center, then of course it's the diameter. And we are told that there is A to C. And we are told that the radius is 5. Well, if the radius is 5, then from here to here, from the center O is 5, and from here to here is 5. This is something we are inserting. And they also tell us 
that this distance here from A to B, we are told, is A. This is given to us. And the question simply is, how does the perimeter of triangle ABC compare versus 24? How does the perimeter of the, tri of the, of the triangle ABC compare with 24? Is it more than 24? Is it less than 24? Is it equal to 24? Let's find out, shall we? Well, this side is given to us. This is A to B is 8. We are told this side we figured out 5 plus 5 is 10. So we have a simple triangle here. We have a simple triangle, a simple right angle triangle here. There's a right angle triangle right here. And we are told that the, the side facing the hypotenuse, the side facing the right angle, the side facing the right angle is 10, which is our hypotenuse. This side is 8. This is the missing side we are trying to figure out. It's very simple, very straightforward. Simple application of Pythagorean theorem will do the job. Or, or we can simply realize that it's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. This is 5 times 2, this is 4 times 2, so this is going to be 3 times 2. This x here is 6. And if we then realize that it's a 3, 4, 5 triangle, then we can do it out. 10 squared, 10 squared is equal to 8 squared minus x squared. That's the of simple Pythagorean theorem as I said, and therefore x squared equals 100 minus 64, which is 36, and therefore x is equal to 6. No big deal. That's it, we're done. So x is equal to 6, therefore the perimeter is going to be 8, this side right here, 8, plus 10, plus 6. That's it, we're done. Those are the three sides here. 8 plus 6 is 14, 14 plus 10 is 24, 24 versus 24, the answer is C. Very simple, very straightforward problem. 55% of people, 55% of people had no trouble with it. 45% of the people actually did miss it. Let's do the next one. Number 15. Always remember to pause the video as soon as, as soon as I set up the problem on the blackboard and do it yourself first. Number 15. Number 15, we are told that we have x, y, and z. x, y, and z, we are told are negative integers. They have to be whole numbers, they have to be whole numbers, they have to be integers, and they have to be negative. So those are the two conditions we have to meet, and what we are being asked to compare is the product of x, y, and z, product of x, y, and z, versus their sum, x plus y plus z. Only 41% only of the people who took the exam got it right. Almost three-fifths of the people missed it. What I want you to do is pause the video, do it yourself, and then once you've done it, unpause it, and then compare your work against the work that we'll do together. Okay, I'll give you two seconds to do just that. Very good. The idea here, the key here, is to plug in numbers. Let's plug in something straightforward, something simple. They have to be negative integers. Let's plug in negative 1 times negative 2 times negative 3, which is a very straightforward, simple thing to do. 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 3 is 6, and then we have 3 negatives, so it's going to be negative 6. And the sum is going to be negative 1 plus a negative 2 plus a negative 3, which is also negative 6. Negative 6 versus negative 6. The answer so far is C. The answer so far is C. Now C does not tell us that the answer is C. That C does not tell us that the answer is C. What it tells us is that now we know that the answer cannot be A or B. Because had the answer been A, A would have meant that the two quantities are always equal. Two quantities cannot be always equal because we have found one instance when they are not equal. So we have four possible answer choices, A, B, C, and D. This does not tell us that the answer is C. What this tells us is that the answer is not A. This also tells us that the answer cannot be B. Because B would have meant that the quantity in column B is always greater. Quantity in column B cannot possibly be always greater because we have one instance when, this, when it is not. They are equal. Answer is either C or D. Our job now is to think, of, think out of the box and think of possibilities that most people will not think of. Think, as I said, think out, out, outside the box. Be creative. They have to be negative. What else can we do? They have to be negative. Here's, here's what you have to do. Here's what we have to think about. How about negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1? All they, all they tell us is that x, y, and z are negative integers. Nowhere in the problem they tell us that they cannot be equal. 
There's no condition where it says one has to be bigger than the other. It doesn't, there is, there doesn't, it doesn't say that, which means it's wide open, which means the possibility exists that they are all negative and they are all equal and they are all negative one, which most people will not think of. If this, if this is what we're dealing with, the negative one times negative one times negative one is negative one, their product is going to be negative one and their sum, their sum is going to be negative three. And now negative three versus negative one, neg negative three times negative one, the answer is no longer C. What the answer is, it doesn't matter. The point, it, it doesn't matter whether it's A or B, we really don't care. The point here is that it's not C, before it was C and now it's not C, before it was C and now it's not C, therefore the answer is D. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.